welcome everyone to How To, um, a little series that we're promoting uh, and sharing uh, our passion for boating uh, with all of you here in the room uh, with electrical systems. So a little bit about myself. Uh, first and foremost, I am a boater. It's who I am, it's my DNA. It's the one word that defines everything about me, I would say. It affects all parts of my life. And um, what I'm here to share with you is sort of a little bit of my approach to boating. Uh, which is trying to avoid surprises. We talked a, lot, a little bit about that. And reduce um, sort of the stress of boating by having a reliable, reliable boat. And one of those aspects is electrical. There's a lot of different parts on a boat. I've decided over time to try to be good at one of them, which is electrical and electronic systems. My background too is I, I'm in the business. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be invited in all of your boats um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Big deal is also doing things by the book. You know, it's important to not sort of have too much bravado or creativity on electrical systems. You want a little bit, but not too much. I have a lot of boaters sometimes, they come and look at the way I did it. I'm like, yeah, it's great that you did it this way, but you know, there is a normal way of doing it and everyone would, else would have understood if we did it the normal way. Right, it's less surprising. It's, you know, why make it complicated? Simple is always better. Uh, for some of you that might be, uh, have subscriptions or have read about our articles, we, re we write two columns every month, one in Pacific Yachting and one in Northwest Yachting. For those of you that don't have a subscription, all those articles are actually published and available online for free on our website. Um, all as PDFs, they go back for Pacific Yachting, I think it's almost nine years now. And for Northwest Yachting, it's over a year. So you, even though you don't have a subscription and you want to geek out, you'll be able to find all articles on all different topics. And of course, as an engineer, I like lists and categories and formats. So everything is categorized on my website. So if you want to read about solar, you go to a page of solar and everything about solar is there. And sure enough, if you want to do, uh, it could be anything. It could be batteries, tons of articles just on batteries. So you can find it sort of like an index or a table of contents, you can find all that content. I am a boater. I mean, I have to be. It's, like I said, it's, I, I don't think I would be in this business and the ups and downs of everything related to boats if I didn't love them. Uh, it's not always easy, but it's extremely rewarding. And as a boater here in the west coast of North America, my favorite cruising grounds are the Broughton Archipelago, which is on the north end of Vancouver Island pretty remote and also last summer we spent the majority of the summer uh, in Barkley Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So I like to sort of go further, places where there's less support, you're more on your own, you don't always see a boat. Uh, and again, reliability of your systems are important. The further you go afield from civilization, the more you need to rely on yourself, either understanding your systems, right, or troubleshooting them because you can't just call out someone. The next thing, um, just for you, a little bit of a background that might not know a little bit about the company uh, that I founded years ago is that we're, we got good by basically repetition, right? S specialization through repetition. We do it over and over again, so we only do a few things, and those are marine electrical and electronics. And today I'm going to be talking about electrical systems. Our service area in terms of actually doing work on boats, and last year we did about a thousand boat projects. Uh, are in British Columbia mostly, and Western Canada, but mostly British Columbia. So American owners, or I've got uh, boat owners from San Francisco, Portland, even Washington State, if we end up doing work, they come to British Columbia for that. The other thing too that's interesting is that a big part of our business, and that's actually where we're learning most of what I'm gonna share with you today, boaters are everywhere around the world. And um, I would say between five to 10 design engagements a week that we're doing. These are boaters, um, you know, they could be somewhere in Guatemala, uh, Venezuela, Abu Dhabi, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Kentucky, uh, Louisiana, everywhere, New Jersey, you name it, Idaho. They're building a boat in their backyard. They've got a sailboat, they've got a houseboat, they're building a trawler, and they're saying, Jeff, I have all these ideas, but I need somebody sort of helping me make sense of my choices, and if I'm gonna do something, and that's what we're gonna be talking about, I wanna do it well once, right? It's easy to scratch a line or erase a line on paper. Once you've built it on your boat and you've taken the time to run a line, 
an electrical and do something and actually execute, and then you, someone else comes on board and says, you shouldn't have done that, you will go through the well of despair. First of all, you're going to fight that that's not a good idea. Then you're going to come to the realization that, yeah, you shouldn't have done that. And that's just not going to be instantaneous. Right? And you'll be like, yeah, I guess I have to redo it all. And then you're going, crap, wouldn't it have been easier to just erase on a piece of paper what was not a good idea and then build? And I always tell, remind people, I mean, how many great things in life have been built without a plan? Think about it. Oh, the high rise was built. Yeah, we didn't have plans. We just sort of free went through it and yeah, look at it, it's, it worked. Most great things in life come with a plan. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today is have a plan. No matter how small the job, how big the job is, it's way better to hash out the details and think about it at the beginning than to do it and then try to explain what you did to someone and then realize maybe you could have done it a different way that would have been much better. Uh, the other one last point I want to emphasize is that some of you have noticed we're filming this presentation. We have over 165 uh, YouTube videos on how to like this. And there's about probably another 30 that are in the pipeline that have already been produced that are coming out. So by the end of the year, I'll we'll probably be at 225 YouTube videos. Again, all categorized, different topics. You can find them on our website or on YouTube. And um, that's a really another way for us to share our knowledge and our passion and even the comments. I'm learning from comments. I'm improving this presentation based on the questions I get on YouTube about things that were maybe misunderstood or that I didn't actually explain properly. Right? It's, again, the community aspect of voting. So questions. Uh, we've got some time. So if you're, feel free to raise your hand. If it's a question that takes longer than a minute to ask, then I would ask that we ask those questions at the end and maybe in the back. If your question is, you know, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, then it's relatively going to be a short answer. If it's a two minute question, then it's probably going to take so much time that it's going to stop the flow of the presentation. So think about your questions for the first part. And if I'll be in the back as long as I need to at the end of these presentations, if your question is a three minute question, I will listen intently. I'll paraphrase, make sure I got it right, and I'll give you the best answer I can. But just think about that when you're asking questions today throughout the presentations. The other thing too is we're going to be posting all these slides on our uh, webpage on pysystems.forward/media, and so you'll be able to access the PDF of this presentation online later on. Make sure that when you're looking at these all conceptual diagrams that we're going to be sharing with you today, these are conceptual diagrams, meaning you can't build your boat from a conceptual diagram. A conceptual diagram is more of a way for us to express ideas, right, to share concepts. It goes obviously more in detail. If you've seen the wiring diagram for your boat, obviously the details are deeper. And I tried to include them in my presentations originally, and most people are like, what the hell am I looking at? There's a thousand different things on that page. I'm like, oh yeah, I get it. I can't, I'm, we're gonna be lost in the weeds. We gotta step, go a little bit higher, and so, we're expressing concepts today on conceptual diagrams. These conceptual diagrams are also available on the website. You can download them and that's how you go about, oh yeah, so that's how a solar panel is connected. Oh, how's a battery combiner work? How does a battery isolator work? Right, and we're gonna be talking about that. Okay, all right, with that, let's get it underway. Let's not get scared, it's okay, but this is what a boat electrical system looks like. Conceptually, on the DC level, that's what it looks like. And our goal here today is to go through every one of those items, specifically the ones on the left-hand side of the slide. And what we're gonna be looking at is every single one of them and how they affect one another. So we're gonna be talking about solar controllers, alternators, battery chargers, methanol fuel cells. We're gonna talk about battery isolators, battery combiners, and we're even gonna be talking a little bit about DC generators and wind turbines. So everything at first should be intimidating, and it's okay, you know? If you want easy, you're not gonna be doing boating. So if we're here in the room as boaters, we know that easy's not, boating isn't, so we're willing to take on a challenge. And you do it one bite at a time, right? And again, with your electrical system on our boats, it's not about understanding all of it, it's understanding one part of it at a time. And eventually it all makes sense, or more sense, as you get to know the system. One important takeaway that I want to leave on this slide, and I cannot emphasize this enough, and we're going to be repeat these words all the time, and ignore at your peril. If you want a world of magic on your boat, and you describe your term in magical terms for the electrical system, 
it's because someone that did the work on your boat forgot or decided to ignore the difference between unswitched distribution and switched distribution. Unswitched distribution means a connection that is directly connected to the battery that is always there, always on. Even when you turn the battery switch off, those loads or charging circuits are always connected to the battery. You can never disconnect those circuits from the battery with a battery switch. That's why it's called an unswitched distribution, right? And the other side is switch distribution. One other little takeaway, electrical is a business of perfection. If that's not, if you know, as a boater, we need to say to ourselves, I'm being asked to be perfect. Am I willing to take on the challenge? And if not, you should not do electrical. Electrical is not a place where you can half it, 80% it, 95% it, 99% it. It's a perfection business. It's you either do it all right or you haven't done it right. It's period. There is no room for error, right? And so as when we take on electrical work, it's important to say I am being challenged here to do everything absolutely right. Every connection has to be done right. The location of the connection has to be in the right place. There is only one right answer, okay? And that's important to remember. It's not like building a table. If the table is a little bit, you know, sort of crooked, doesn't look great, you know what? It still works. Electrical is not like that. It's not like carpentry. It can't just, it's not about looking great or not. It's about, it's got to be safe, reliable, right? And that's very important. Okay, so the other thing too that we're going to, I want to emphasize here is the AC system of electrical uh, or marine electrical system pretty much looks like what we have here on the slide. You're going to have sources of AC coming on board, right? On the left-hand side, you have shore power and you have a generator. These are pretty much the only two sources of AC on a boat. You can have multiple generators. You know, we get invited to work on 100-footers, 120-footers, 150-footers. They might have three generators. You know, port, starboard, a night gen. You know, a lot of North Ovens, you know, 75, they might have a big gen, a small gen, you know, day gen, night gen. It doesn't matter how many generators you have, how many shore power receptacles you have, you might have shore power receptacle up front in the half. You might have two up front, two in the half. A Bayliner 4788 has three AC inputs, right? Line one, line two, line three, doesn't matter. It's just more sources running the panel. It looks intimidating, but actually AC on a boat is pretty simple. There's not a lot of magic with AC. Because generally nobody in their right mind would work on AC if they didn't know what they were doing. From a matter of safety, that's a place where you really do not want to take any chances. So you basically have multiple sources and then you end up having a source selector. You need to decide what's going to run the boat. Is it going to be the generator, shore power, and that feeds a panel. And then in turn from the panel, you might have what are called inverter loads. Now you might not have two AC panels on your boat, but in the back it's wired like it's two different panels. Okay. So when you have an inverter on board, most installs are going to have a, basically a sub-panel for inverter loads. Not all. Remember, there's no sort of one way only way with marine electrical. There's a lot of differences right, and, and possibilities. But I'd say 95% are going to have sort of non-inverter loads. Non-inverter loads would be like a hot water heater, uh, a battery charger. You wouldn't want to run a battery charger from your inverter. right? An inverter takes power from the batteries. You wouldn't want to bat charge your batteries from your batteries. It's the opposite of a Leonardo da Vinci infinity machine. It's just not going to work. And I've seen that a lot. People are literally go cruising and they're like, my batteries are dying all the time. I've got weak batteries. And sure enough, it's because their inverter is powering the battery charger. And while they were underway, they're like, I want my battery charger on. Oh, I don't have AC. I'll make an inverter on. And they're not understanding. And I never laugh. I'm like, yeah, it makes, it's confusing. Somebody wired it badly. So you made that error. It's not that your batteries are a problem, it's that you're charging your batteries from your batteries. And basically, that's it. AC systems are pretty straightforward. It doesn't matter if it's a 70-footer or a 30-footer. They pretty much are just more of the same. We'll talk a little bit about AC. So next, what we're going to get into is um, when you're thinking about doing an electrical system or improving on your electrical system, because most of us are not doing a complete refit of our electrical, we're saying, I'm going to tackle a part of the electrical. There's some things that are good on my boat, and there's some things that are not so good on my boat. And you're going to say, OK, I'm going to be doing improvements or changes or a whole overall change. You've got to start thinking about requirements. And these are the things that you need to hash out before you go down the path, right? 
generally you got to think about what are all the different things you're going to run on your boat. Don't do the electrical system and then start adding like, oh yeah, I'm going to, I've decided now two years in that I'm going to add a windlass. I've decided now that I'm going to do an inverter. Oh, I'm going to decide that, uh, you know, I'm not going to stay overnight one night, I'm going to stay overnight three nights. All these things need to be hashed out at the beginning. If you're building a house, how many rooms you're going to have in that house have to be figured out at the outset. You can't tell the builder while underway, like, oh yeah, I didn't think about my daughter's room. Can we add that? Oh yeah, we're doing a bottom, you know, a basement suite. Can we add that? All those discussions in your mind have to happen at the beginning. So start dreaming, you know? Where's my boat going to be in five years, two years? And so figure out all of your AC and DC loads. The other thing that's really important is figuring out how much power you're going to need a day. It's important to, if you're planning to retire, and you're going to say, how much money do I need in the bank to retire? One of the other variables you need to ask yourself is what's my burn rate? How much money do I need a year will influence how many, much money you need in the bank to retire. And sizing a battery bank is directly correlated to how many amp hours you use every day on your boat. It's got to be. Otherwise, world of surprises and disappointments. You might buy too many batteries or too little. The other variable that's really important is how frequently will you have an opportunity to recharge your batteries? And I can't state that enough. Some boaters have a generator on board and they run that generator morning and night. Some boaters actually, believe it or not, run their generator 24-7. I had a boater that had a 36-footer and he was okay running his generator 24-7. You know, it didn't bother him. He doesn't have battery problems. Does not have battery problems. The generator is running all the time, running a battery charger. He doesn't need really, I mean, he has batteries, but he could have one. Right, the generator is constantly running. Now that's one end of the spectrum. Another end of the spectrum is potentially a sailboater that wants to stay on the hook for two weeks without running the generator or charger, i.e. a generator or even the alternator. How are you going to do that? Are you going to have solar to recharge the batteries? Are you going to have a wind turbine? How are you going to recharge the batteries to stay on the hook for a week, two weeks or three days? Right? And the other thing to consider is, well, how many battery banks am I going to have on the boat? You know, some boaters, you know, you might have a 20-foot boat, 15-foot boat, they have one battery, one engine. You know, the downrigger, the char plotter is just running. For example, imagine a tender, 15-foot tender, a rib. One battery on board, starts the engine, also runs maybe a simple VHF radio. That's as simple as it gets, a single battery. You might have a boat and you're saying, well, actually, a little bit of division of labor. A battery for the engine, a battery for the house. Oh, I have two engines. A battery for port engine, a battery for starboard engine. Oh, I've got a generator, generator battery. Oh, uh, I actually have thrusters. I have forward and aft. Battery for forward thruster, battery for aft thruster. You know, I'm having a windlass and my windlass is obviously at the bow and my house battery banks are way at the aft. I'm going to have a windlass battery, right? Some boaters have inverter only battery banks. The most amount of battery banks I've seen on a boat so far is six. But that's something you've got to think about. Well, how many different battery banks are you going to have? There's definitely such a thing as too many, but you want to have as little as possible within reason, right? One is probably always too little, and then you've got to do not more than you need, and you sort of like are pushing and pulling against yourself, right? I need no more than I want, and I need no little than I want. So you've got to find that magic number of battery banks that you're going to have in your boat. So with that, oh yeah, and one, two last points. Again, if you're a totally, completely new boat, you might decide, am I going to go with 24 volt boat? Or am I going to do 12, right? Big implication on there. You're seeing more and more 24 volt boats right now, especially above 50 feet. And then uh, is the boat coming from Europe? Is it a 220 boat, a 120 boat? Are you going to have 220 loads coming in? Are you going to be a, a big AC user boat? Are you going to have air conditioning on board? Right? You can't run air conditioning on just, and run your boat just on a simple 30 amp 120. You might need a 50 amp 220. So all these things you start need to think about at the beginning. Always create a plan and think where you're going to go before you start your journey. Super important. Okay? All right. So with that, we're going to start with batteries. There's a lot of choice with batteries. I mean, that's the good thing and that's also the bad thing. Right? It's a little bit overwhelming. You go in a marine battery store and you're like, I want a marine battery. They're like, okay, well, let's start the journey. And that's what we're going to talk a little about, about the journey of choosing the right battery for your boat. There's no such thing as a perfect battery for everyone. There isn't. If there was, it'd be easy. I'd show one slide. We're like, done, battery checkbox. Here's the, you know, the silver bullet and we move on. 
it, unfortunately, like with most things on a boat, and I, rem I remind that to a lot of boaters, there's no such thing as a perfect boat, regardless of money. You have a billion dollars, you spend it on a boat, at the end of the day, you're making, a, not a thousand, you're making a hundred thousand decisions that are compromises. I want a bigger boat, you're gonna have this and that. You're constantly moving these levers that affect something else, right? And so money doesn't even solve all problems. Size doesn't solve all problems. All about compromises. You could have a 30 footer, a 100 footer, a 50 footer, it doesn't matter. You're constantly choosing. So batteries is one of those things you have to choose as a boater. Most of us, as a boater, will end up choosing pretty much with what's called our flooded lead acid batteries or sealed lead acid batteries. Seal valve lead acid batteries. Those are AGMs, absorbed glass mat or gels. Flooded lead acid batteries are the batteries that we all had in our cars 20 years ago, right? They, they had electrolyte, you know, there was battery acid in them. It was in a flooded state, liquid state. We're seeing more and more seal valve regulated batteries on boat nowadays, right? And those are AGM and also Firefly batteries. And another word that's commonly used, and we're seeing that a little bit more and more, it's coming out more and more every year as well, are lithium batteries, lithium phosphate iron batteries. Again, don't get caught up in, oh, I, I need an AGM because my neighbor has one. No, not that easy. There's a lot of choice and we're going to talk a little bit. I'm, here the next slide is going to show you some of the differentiators between lead acid batteries. Remember, AGM is a lead acid battery, gel is a lead acid battery, flooded lead acid is a lead acid battery. So there's three big choices with lead acid batteries. We're going to focus on the next slide between Firefly AGM AGM and flooded. One of the first differentiators is cost. Don't kid yourself, the least expensive battery, not the best value battery, but if cost is king and that's the only thing you care about and you want the least expensive battery, you're gonna go for a flooded acid battery, no doubt. It's gonna be the lowest number on the battery, no doubt. Now, if it was that easy and you can buy things just strictly based on cost, we'd probably all be eating fast food every day and nobody would ever worry about organic or anything else. It'd be fast food all the way, the only way. But low cost is not necessarily best value. There's generally something in the between from low cost. And so you can see the differences in dollar signs. These are sort of trying to represent the cost. A Firefly battery is gonna be probably three times more money than a good quality flooded acid battery. So why would you do that? Why would you spend three times the price? Well, it's in sort of the benefits that you get as a boater. One of them is life cycles, right? And I'm gonna actually, next I'm gonna talk about cycle. I should talk about battery life. Battery life is basically 4X, 5X. So if you're buying a battery and you're changing your batteries every three to five years, your Firefly batteries are gonna last four times that long. At 50% depth of discharge, a Firefly battery has 3,600 cycles. A flooded battery has 300 cycles. That's 12x, I get the math. But if you go all the way down to 20% of capacity, a Firefly battery has 1,200 cycles, and a flooded battery at 50% has 300. So you're trading, you're saying, you know what, I, I'm buying batteries, but I don't want to do this again. This is the last time I want to buy batteries. That's where you would end up doing Firefly batteries. The other thing, a big takeaway between AGM and flooded is you have more usable battery capacity. And this is important because what you see is not what you get with a battery. A 200 amp hour battery is not 200 amp hours of usable battery capacity. You can do it, but you're gonna have a very short battery life. I have very stubborn uh, clients and we see them every couple years. They refuse to ignore my advice about not discharging their batteries to 50% on flooded. And unfortunately, I tell them, we're, I mean, I, I, I don't mind seeing you that often. It's fun, it's good for the business, but isn't it frustrating to change your batteries every couple of years when you could be changing them every five, 10 years if you actually maintain them properly and you didn't work them so hard? So the depth of discharge of that battery is really important. You don't wanna go too deep on the discharge, okay? And the other thing too that's really a big takeaway, especially with Firefly, is that they can live in a partial state of discharge without affecting battery capacity. What does, that, what does that mean? It means that it prevents premature aging. Firefly batteries, um, and they're a perfect example, so for cruisers, people that are going away from a marina for a long period of time, 
they're off the dock for two months, three months, or they're going offshore. If you're boating and you're not anchoring or docking every night and you're off the grid for two months, three months, a year, you're going off grid, you want a battery that will not sulfate prematurely, that can stay always between 50 and 80% and never get to 100% charge. And the way that you do that, the way that you do that is having a battery that is tolerant to a partial state of discharge. And that's why some boaters will choose if it makes sense for them, we'll choose a Firefly battery, even though it might be three, four times the price of a flooded battery, because they know that they're living in that partial state of discharge all the time. Here are some examples of some battery banks installed on boats. And I have a full one hour presentation just on batteries. And we also do a course on marine electrical systems, and then it's a two hour presentation just on batteries. And I could do eight hours, I could do 12, but people would be running for the excess, we'd have to lock the doors. <laughs> So if you're going to be uh, installing a battery bank on your boat, here are some tips. You want the battery bank to be in one physical location. Now, I'm not saying all battery banks in one location. You want, if you have house batteries and you have four house batteries, you don't want two on the port, two on the starboard. Your battery bank for your house has to be in one location. And again, today, people sometimes say, Jeff, why? If we did the why on everything, we would be here for 100 hours. The why is the longest. The what is easy. The why is, I'll tell why as long as you want me to do, but again, I'll do that in private in the back, um, and I can explain you all the whys. These are just the whats. Really important that you also fuse all non-starter loads to a battery bank. That is a black and white. I can tell you every single one of you, unless it's a brand new boat, untouched. If it's a factory boat, this rule is followed. Every boat from a factory is going to follow this rule. The moment your boat leaves the factory and you invite someone on your boat or a previous owner wired your boat, I can guarantee you that 99.999% of you have circuits that are unfused. Guaranteed. Because it's path of least resistance. You don't need a fuse until you need one. The circuit works. It's like a seat belt. You've never used your seat belt unless you've been in an accident. You just don't need one until you do. So it works without a fuse. And that's the thing, a fuse is not critical for it to work. It's critical for you to protect your circuit in the event of a short or overcurrent situation that could happen. Okay, next we're going to talk a little bit about power. Oh, yes, question? Sorry, question about batteries. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how important is uniformity within the same bank? Is all of the same family okay, or do they need to be a Really good question. The question uh, by one of the attendees was, when I'm installing a battery bank, should the battery bank be of all the same uniformity? They should be all the same, and absolutely, black and white. You cannot, and this is, this is one of the main reasons that you need to evenly maintain your battery banks. It's a little bit like tires in a car. You can't have tires that are four or five years old, you lose one, and you just change a tire. You can't have a brand new tire with three old tires. If you change a battery midstream, or even new batteries, they all have to be the same. They have to all start the same. Brand new batteries all go together. If you have AGM, they all have to be AGM. Everything has to be the same. You can't, you can't mix golf cart batteries with group 31 batteries with an AD battery, no mismatch. You can do it, but then also don't ask yourself why you were unlucky that you're changing your batteries frequently. You're into a world of hurt. Shortcuts rarely pan out in life. Rarely pan out. We're looking for them all the time. But you don't want to do a shortcut that has been proven to not work. So you always want to have battery banks that are the same age, right? the same type, same chemistry. And if one battery bank fails, or a battery fails out of a battery bank four years from now, you change the whole bank. Another question up front? I always see pictures of wiring installations with large bundles. Doesn't that cut your ampacity drastically? The question from the gentleman up front is, when you have large bundles of wiring, does that cut your ampacity? And the answer is yes. And the reason it's because of heat. Bundles of wiring, the ideal, and we can't do this in our boats. You can do it in ferries and ships. You'll see if you're ever on a ferry or ship, you look up, there's actually wiring trays. The wires are sort of mismatch going in the tray. That's really good for heat dissipation. You keep everything together, bundled. That's how you get warm outside. You're cold. Hug someone. You know? You put a bundle and you keep everything. And then they're actually in the ABYC, they'll have charts. They're like, how many wires are bundled together? In a boat, the challenge is it looks neat, 
and we want things to look good, but if you've got a really big bundle, that's going to actually derate your cable for opacity. So that means you need a larger cable when it goes in a bundle. And there are tables that actually specify that. So good question. Another question up front. Is, a, is the term Firefly, is that a brand of battery or a type? Good question. Is Firefly a type of battery or a brand? Firefly is a brand that is also a type, meaning it's a foam core based AGM. They have a patent. It was invented for Caterpillar. And that battery now is, they're the only ones that do that. So they sort of have, because they have the patent, yes, it's a brand name, but it also happens to be the only one that can do that battery. It was an American made product. Uh, the inventor actually lives on the east coast of the United States in Maine. Amazingly smart man. Amazingly smart. Game changer, by the way. Huge game changer. Yes, gentlemen, question over here. Yes, if you, if you buy a boat, and the house batteries are already separated from starboard uh, and port. Uh, and uh, the extra battery, the fifth battery in this case, is even separated remotely. Um, can you, you still have to use the rule of everything going positive uh, one end and everything negative coming from the other end? So the, the question by the gentleman is, I, we have a boat. Situation happens, by the way. Boats aren't perfect. If they were, none of us would be looking at making our boats better or fixing them, right? I mean, that's what brought me to this business. A boat has multiple battery banks connected together, like, or multiple batteries connected in one bank. One on port side, one on starboard side, and even a third one in another location. Well, first of all, as we know, the rule is you shouldn't have that, but that's what you have, and you decide to live with it. Your choice. Should the positive and negative be at opposite ends? Should you try to act like the battery was in one location and it isn't and have the positive at one end of the battery bank and the negative at the other? And the answer is a, a yes, absolutely. Again, I can't tell you the why because we'd be here for days. I have lots of stamina. I'm a business owner. <laughs> lots of stamina. But we're not going to do it. But the answer is yes. You have to have it at the opposite ends. Now, you remember, here's another little takeaway. As a boater, the good news is you can do whatever you want in North America on your boat. And the bad news is you can do whatever you want on a boat. <laughs> Honestly, that's why I'm in this business. I thought a boat was like a car. There's only one right way. There was the manufacturer's way. And if you bought a Toyota, you know, you sort of got the Toyota way, and that's what you're buying. When you buy a boat, the moment it leaves the factory, the world of creativity and MacGyverism happens. People take shortcuts, and they do not know the shortcuts implications. And that's good news or bad news? Somebody was really happy that they were able to take a shortcut, and nobody's, there's no standards police. On land, it would be criminal. Somebody, if somebody dies because you miswired a house, they're coming after you. There is no end. On a boat, hey, it was sort of your way. And that's the good news and the bad news. It's good news for the MacGyvers out there, and it's bad news for people that sort of like safety. I'm Mr. Safety. I boat for pleasure. I don't want to have my boat catch, catch on fire. I don't want to have a boat that's unreliable. I want a boat that's predictable. I like it sort of the way that it should be. So good news or bad news, depending on your perspective. All right, with that, we're going to start on uh, power generation. So power generation is, I mean, batteries are one thing. But remember, batteries are just a way that for you to store power. Right, that's it. So how do you go about charging batteries? through alternators, solar, methanol, fuel cells, so we're going to go through a little bit of that. So on the diagram, all battery chargers, now an inverter, it can be two things. Remember, an inverter can be an inverter charger or an inverter. If it's an inverter only, it's not a charging source, it can go to the switch distribution because it's a load, right? But remember, a lot of us, the majority of us on boats have inverter chargers. Those are sort of weird devices. It's a load, but it's also a charger. And if you have an inverter charger, that inverter charger has to be connected to the unswitched distribution via its own switch. And we'll talk about that. On the slide here, I'm showing an inverter as a load only. And if it's an inverter only device, that device is on the switch distribution. Again, ignore it at your peril. Ignore it at your peril. Electrical is blamed all the time. I read you know, books from the 70s and 80s, and they talk about how electrical is magical and is reliable, unreliable, frustrating. Blaming a wire. Think about it. It's an inanimate object, has no intelligence. It simply was installed by a person. 
and we blame electrical for being unreliable. There is nothing more beautiful and simple and predictable than electrical. It's not that this, the wires are electrical is unpredictable, is the person that did it didn't know what they were doing, right? People make mistakes, it happens. Electrical is not unreliable. People installing electrical systems make mistakes and those mistakes are never identified and become very frustrating pain points and we blame electrical systems, but we should blame the installer. Electrical, when it's done right, it works flawlessly, absolutely flawlessly. So here I want to emphasize, um, and especially if you have a boat that has over the ages has improved or changed, especially if the battery bank with this gentleman had more batteries than probably the builder had put in, you want to make sure that your charge rate on your battery charger is at least 10% of your deep cycle battery bank size. Every boat builder that I've ever been, I've ever seen, been on, because again, I get invited, thank you, on literally, we get to work on a thousand boats a year. I don't get to see a thousand boats a year, but I get to see hundreds. I've never seen a brand new boat that does not have a battery charger that is 10% of the battery bank size. Every single designer of electrical system and every manufacturer does this rule. The problem is that as boaters, we end up at buying more batteries on our boat. We for often, too often, forget to increase the battery charger size. Thinking, hoping, that the designer size a battery charger for all possible permutations of your battery bank in the foreseeable future. No one does that. I tell this all the time with new employees. There is no hope. I want it to know. I want you to confirm it. I want you to check it. Oh, I think. Don't think. Tell me. Is the battery charger size to handle this battery bank size? Over. If you have a not brand new boat, 90% of you have battery chargers that are too small. And a direct consequence of that is that your battery banks are dying or aging prematurely and you're losing your battery banks too soon because your battery charger is not 10% of your battery bank size. So if you value money and your time, make sure your battery charger is at least 10% of your battery bank size. So, for example, if you have four golf cart batteries wired in a 12-volt battery bank, let's call it 400 amp hours, marketing would tell you 460 and, you know, they're going to make the numbers as stretch as humanly possible. But let's call it 400, you need a 40 amp charger on a 400 amp hour battery bank. That's what it is. It doesn't so much affect engine batteries because engine batteries are not brought to a deep cycle level, right? There's a big difference between starter batteries and deep cycle batteries. If you're curious, again, you can see a bunch of YouTube videos just on that topic. Now, there's also an upper end limit. You can't charge a battery as fast as you want regardless, right? So AGM is theoretically around 40, flooded theoretically around 25, lithium theoretically 300%. So that means if you have a 400 amp hour battery bank, you could theoretically charge that battery bank at 1200 amps. Sounds great. But I, I, I can guarantee you that you cannot go to a chandlery and say, by the way, I'm looking for a 1200 amp charger. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. There is no such thing as a 1200 amp charger. The largest battery charger on the market is a 100 amp 24 volt charger. That's it. So looking for a 1200 amp charger is, you're going to start looking for a long time. And not on the internet either. Can't, it doesn't happen. So you want to have a battery charger that's not too big, not too small, and you want to be realistic with your expectations. So generally, we size battery chargers a little bit bigger and we try to give them about 20% of capacity as a way to reduce charge time. And that's really important if you have a generator. Now again, some owners don't care about running their generators all the time, so for them it doesn't matter. But if you, for whatever reason, and there might be a few good reasons that I can think of, not running your generator you know, 24 hours a day and you don't want to run it eight hours a day or 10 hours a day, and you only want to run it two hours or four hours, then increase your charger size. Not size, but add multiple chargers. I have some boats we have, we had a 24 volt boat, we have 350 amps at 24 volts by adding multiple chargers on the bulkhead. You can stack or daisy chain chargers, okay? This is what basically a charger layout looks like. Now I can't emphasize this enough, a battery charger is powered by AC. Your engine, even a generator, when the generator is running, it creates, especially if you have an AC generator, it creates AC and then AC powers a charger. 
Chargers used to be called converters. That's the word that we would use. The opposite of an inverter, right? Inverter, converter, they sound opposite. Similar, but opposite. That word died, unfortunately, because converters were, we didn't understand what was going on and battery, we were overcharging them. So nobody uses the word converter anymore. You can't buy a converter. You just can't, you buy battery chargers now. Battery chargers are bulk absorption float, three stage. Now they even have a fourth stage. But at the end of the day, a battery charger is powered by AC. So it's either when you connect it to shore power or you have an AC generator running and then you power, send AC to the device, the device takes that AC, converts it, and through a three phase smart charging curve, recharges your battery. When your engine is running, an engine, propulsion engine is running, there is no propulsion engine that is running that creates AC to run a battery charger. A lot of people think, and I get this all the time, they're like, Jeff, do I need my battery charger on when I'm running my engine? I'm like, they're unrelated. They're not, they're not at all. Your alternator is running or turning and creating DC power when you're underway or at idle, depending, but not a battery charger. So to recap, you want at least 10% of a battery bank, one second, at least 10% of your battery bank deep cycle size as a charge rate. I can't emphasize this enough. Practically 95% of you have a battery charger with no fusing on it. Again, you don't need a seat belt to drive your car. Besides the law and your conscience, you do not need a seat belt. Your car will work without a seat belt. Unfortunately, when you need a seat belt and you're not buckled in, it's gonna be a life experience. It's gonna be a very memorable moment. Unforgettable, actually. And if you have a dead short on any wire size on your boat, it will maybe your last day on the water if you make it out of your boat. It will change your life. So fusing battery charger leads is absolutely essential. And the point that I'm emphasizing here, which is again really important, battery chargers need to be directly connected to the unswitched distribution. Meaning when you turn your battery switch off, your charger is still connected to your batteries. Right, that is the rule. Absolutely, now it happens to be honest, happens off too often that the battery charger is connected to the switch on side of your switch. Meaning when you turn that battery switch off, your charger is disconnected from your batteries. Can't have that. A lot of good reasons, worlds of magic if that happens. All right, here's a little bit of slide of an inverter. The inverter is the gray device in the middle. What is an inverter? An inverter is a device that creates AC from DC, right? The opposite of a converter. And why would you have an inverter on your boat? You'd have an inverter on your boat if you wanna have the benefits of running household appliances on your boat when you don't have a generator or you're not gonna connected to shore power. For example, on my boat, I run a coffee machine, an espresso, from my batteries through an inverter. I love coffee. It's one of the pleasures of my life. I have an espresso machine, and even if we're in an anchorage in the middle of nowhere, I'll turn the inverter on, and my Nespresso machine is gonna take AC power from the inverter, and the inverter takes DC power from the battery bank. It could be running a microwave. It could be running a TV, right? There's a bunch of what are called non-inverter loads. Non-inverter loads are a hot water tank. AC hot water tank is not something you wanna run off your inverter. You can, but your batteries are gonna be dead in 20 minutes, right? So big, big loads should not be run off an inverter. Like air conditioning, you know, could be run, but then you've got a big, big battery bank. You're gonna have a lithium battery bank. You need a big, big electrical system to run large AC loads on your boat. There's no end, of course. You can run a city off an inverter. There's inverters the size almost of this room, right? But again, the problem is on our boats, we're taking power from our batteries and our batteries are limited. There's no such thing or very rarely too big a battery bank we're limited by space and weight and our budgets. You know, otherwise we'd have bigger battery banks if we could. It's like a little bit like money. Very few of us ever have the luxury of saying I have too much money. It's very rare. I don't think I've ever met an owner who said, Jeff, you know what, I've got too much battery banks. I, I, you know, I wish I didn't have as many. It's, it's a hassle to not worry about power. I've never heard those words, never, it's never happened. You always wish you had a little bit more 
Or you're happy with what you have, but too much power? No. Inverters are the number one device that is installed unsafely on pretty much all of our boats. And it comes down to, unfortunately, the manual is almost, I mean, the manual's almost a centimeter thick. It's about 70, 100 pages. And unfortunately, most men install inverters. Unfortunately, if women install inverters, they'd probably be done right. And most men, you know what? They're born with knowledge. They don't need to read a manual. Manuals are stupid. They're for other people. And the other bad news is when you buy an inverter, you're not actually buying all the pieces that are required to install an inverter. You're just buying one part of the inverter system. So there's no switch, there's no fuse, there's no wiring. And you can get away with getting an inverter to work without actually wiring it properly. Less than 1% of boats have inverters pro wired properly. And the reason is most factories don't install inverters. If a factory installed an inverter, I can tell you there'd be an engineer there going nuts and a lawyer in the office going, you're crazy. We'll lose our name, we'll be sued, we'll lose everything we have if we have a boat fire because we badly installed an inverter. They would never do it. They have either a conscience or they love their money too much to not care. But the problem is, is most inverters are done, 99% are done after factory. And then welcome to the world of get it done, make someone happy, please someone, do it in as little time as humanly possible. And say, you know, why would an inverter take two, three days to install? I install mine in four, in four hours. You're not doing an apples to apples comparison. One person took a bunch of shortcuts and the other person did it right. So if you're looking and you have an inverter on your boat, make sure all these items are on your boat. You need a class T fuse. You absolutely need a service disconnect. You need an inverter only neutral bus. Proper size ground chassis wire. The location of the inverter cannot be in a, in a gasoline engine room. And the inverter cannot be 30 feet away from your batteries. When I find an inverter properly installed, no matter how inappropriate it is, I ask the owner if we can high five. I'm like, this is a special moment. You have a properly installed inverter. Let's celebrate. That's how rare it is. I'll see a properly installed inverter maybe once a year. Once a year. That's how the manual is just simply too thick. You can't read that. It's 100 pages. Why would you do that? Question, anybody on inverters? All right, next thing we're gonna be talking about is alternators. If you look on the slide here, on the left-hand slide, pretty much every single boat that comes out of the factory, and this is 99.999, unless you might have a North Oven, maybe a Fleming, maybe a Celine, you know, maybe, all boats are wired like on the left hand side, meaning this alternator is directly wired. The output, the positive output from your alternator is daisy chained to the starter solar node post, post on your starter. It's a short little wire. It's going to be, I don't care how big your engine, your engine could be bigger than I am, like wider, like eight feet long, 10 feet long. The alternator is going to be slightly forward of the starter. You're going to have maybe a four feet, five feet piece of wire. On my boat, my engine's only this big. The wires are about this long. And the, from the positive post of the alternator to the starter solenoid, solenoid post. What that means is that if you ever turn your battery switch off and every single battery switch on every single boat has a tiny little label at the bottom, and I learned this the hard way because I had lots of bravado when I bought my boat. Lots of bravado. I was not humbled yet. I've been humbled. If you saw the scars on my body from doing things the wrong way, I'd be disfigured. I learned it the hard way. And I remember, I was an engineer, right, out of school, 2006, lots of bravado. The alternator doesn't seem to be working. I'm like, I got this. Must be the switch. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm like, maybe the switch is faulty. Turn the switch on, turn the switch, well, the switch was on. Turn it off, turn it on again. I can guarantee you that if I had, if I had an alternator or not problem before, I created an alternator problem. Literally at the bottom of the switch in small fine print is never turn battery switch off when engine is running. 
Every single switch on every single boat has that because the alternator cannot be disconnected when the engine is running. And if you do so, you blow up your alternator. So I blew up my alternator two weeks after buying my boat. This is sort of the genesis of being here. I felt so stupid. And I was like, no, this is, no. I'm not gonna you know, bravado my way into all of this. I gotta start educating. That's why I started with forums, books, Don Casey. I had a boat owner yesterday saying, Jeff, I wanna educate myself. Uh, Nigel Calder, you know, all these sort of famous authors. There's tons of forums. I mean, as a boater, if you're curious, it's a huge tap of information out there, right? Be curious. And that's why with an alternator, after that problem, I went, again, reading Nigel Calder, who's presenting in the room a little down the road, just on the few stages down the way over there. I decided, okay, I'm gonna do it the right way. I'm gonna run a large wire directly to my house battery bank. I'm not gonna have it switched anymore. I'm gonna have it fused, but not switched. I'm gonna make it foolproof, me being the fool, right? So I basically said, I don't wanna make that error ever again again. So I wired the alternator directly to the house battery. Make sure, and, I, and you remember when we talked about battery chargers not increasing with the battery bank size over time? That happens too with alternators. We end up putting larger and larger battery banks on our boat, but the alternator does increase in size with it, right? I go on boats, uh, let's say for example, um, Grand Banks 42 had you know, one AD, well port and starboard AD, 55 stack stock alternator, remember 55, 220, 240, that's almost a 25% ratio, right? So the alternator is perfectly sized for that battery bank, no problem. And then later down the road, that boat now doesn't only have one AD or a 240 amp hour battery bank, it has three more of them, right? So now you have an 800, 900 amp hour battery bank that is charged by a 55 amp alternator. And then I get a call from the owner, he's like, it's taking forever. I'm doing eight hours of motoring a day. My battery bank still doesn't get charged. I'm like, it's not the motor the problem, is that your alternator is too small for your battery bank size. Remember, a battery bank is like a big wallet or a large bank account or a huge safe. It's one thing to have a big safe, but putting money into it is the hard part, right? Earning is hard. Storing it is one thing. Earning energy and being able to size it, size an alternator, size a charger so that you can recharge your battery bank at the right rate of charge is very important and often overlooked. Question, gentlemen. She's got a used boat. Is there any way to check the alternator to know what the output is? Question is, um, we have, or someone has a used boat and I'm wondering what size alternator is it? You'll be able to see a little nameplate. It's about, maybe about this big, sort of like on top of the alternator, you know, following the curve of the alternator. A little nameplate, hopefully it's not been worn, and you'll be able to see the size of the alternator. It's gonna generally say, you know, 75, 55, 90, 120. Some alternators are like 260 amps, 300 amps on large engines. But generally the stock alternator is 55 amps. All right, with that we're gonna start, the next thing we're gonna talk about is solar. When you do a solar battery, ba oh, gentlemen here, question. I have a twin engine. My start battery for alternator is one size. Can I change the upgrade because my house batteries are bigger? Bigger load? So, I have the same alternator on each engine. Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Yeah, so if you've got a boat, two engines, which is not uncommon for a lot of power boaters, or catamarans, right? Power or sail. And I've got one alternator, let's say, connected to a starter battery. And I have another alternator connected to my house battery. Should I consider changing, which alternator, I'm gonna make it a little bit more open, which alternator should I consider changing first? I would change the one connected to my house battery, right? Because that's the one that needs the most. Think about your, you know, that, the house battery bank is generally the largest battery bank. You know, you could have, it doesn't matter how big your boat is, it's generally gonna be in multiples of. You know, your house battery bank might be 100 amp hours, well, obviously they're measured in, in cold cranking amps, but generally it's gonna be maybe 5X, 10X. You know, I have some boats that have 10 more house batteries than they do engine batteries in size. And so if you've got, you know, a really large house battery bank, 
The first alternator you should think about changing is the house one. And most of the time, the, the alternator for your engine battery is perfectly fine. As long as you're not running too many large loads on your engine battery while underway. I had a boater, brand new boat, 52 footer. The engine room got too hot. They would run these huge fans in the engine room to cool down the engine room underway. Massive fans, like I'm talking like huge. While underway, their alternator was so small that after four hours of leaving the marina, their engines would die because their alternator output could not meet the demand of running those fans. And the engine would die because it was an electronic engine. So if there's no power to the digital control module, control module dies, engine dies. The owner had to run his generator to run battery chargers to power the fans to run his engine. No joke, brand new boat, $2 million. Yeah, got missed. Hey, if it was easy, I don't even laugh. If it was easy, we would not all be here in the room learning about it, right? If something easy, it's done. So I go back and I'm like, yeah, it's, it's a big puzzle. You know, I don't laugh anymore. I'm like, yeah, it's not easy. That's why it's interesting. If it was easy, I wouldn't be doing it. Solar. So with solar, basically what you've got is you've got a solar panel connected to a controller. So this is really essential, and I can't emphasize this enough. You cannot have a solar panel directly connected to a battery bank. Your battery banks might be completely charged. You're connected to shore power. I had that question asked last night on YouTube. I have a large solar panel, um, and is it gonna be okay to have a battery charger connected to a battery bank with a solar panel connected to a controller at the same time? Meaning, I'm connected to shore power, I have a battery charger, it's turned on, the sun is shining, now I have two sources of power coming to one battery. Am I gonna be okay? And because both a battery charger and a solar controller are voltage regulated through a three-phase smart charging profile, right? Bulk, absorption, float. Yes, you can have two charging devices at the same time today. Like on my boat, I have six solar panels, six controllers, and I can be connected to shore power, seven charging sources of power all at the same time, and won't overcharge, because all of them are being smart. They're like, do I need to help? No, I won't do anything. They'll back off. What I'm emphasizing on the left part of the slide here is I'm talking about a dedicated panel, dedicated controller. And there's reason, you might do this for reasons of shading, right? Like if you're a sailboater or a powerboater and you have a huge arch and you've got lots of things above your solar panels and your panels might experience shading. Your sailboater, you have solar panels, for example, on your Dodger. You have a boom. You know, part of the day, one panel is gonna be shaded. Part of the other day, the other panel is gonna be shaded, assuming you're not moving. And then only when the sun is directly overhead, you might have sun shining perfectly on both panels without shading. Well, when that happens, you know, when we install solar panels on Dodgers, we end up doing a dedicated controller per panel, right? So that each panel is perfectly tuned for the sunlight conditions that it's experiencing at that given moment. I had another client, again, last night on YouTube, ask me another question. They're like, I'm putting three solar panels, but I've got a huge bimini, and I do not have any shading. Can, do, should I wire dedicated controllers, or should, can I wire them in series? I'm like, besides redundancy, which would be a good reason to do dedicated controllers per panel, you can wire your three solar panels in series, which is what I'm showing on the right-hand side. Here we only have two, to a single controller. So I generally will wire panels in series. If the panels, I might do, let's say, one side of a bimini, right? On a bimini, I might have a lot of solar panels. I might have two or three on one side of the bimini. If they're all the same type, same size, I might wire them in series, and then have some on the port side, some on the starboard side, wires in series. Again, there's no easy answer. You gotta think about it, pros and cons but you do not want to have a panel that's on the port that's going to experience different shading conditions than one on starboard and then have them connected in series or especially in parallel. Question. Yeah, controllers, does each need an independent path to the battery bank? The question is if you have multiple solar controllers connected to obviously multiple solar panels, do you need to have an independent battery uh, path, an independent path to the battery bank? Um, the answer is no, you can aggregate. 
Like on my boat, I have four solar controllers at the back of my boat, and I aggregate the four, larger wire, fused, going to the battery bank. So you can start aggregating. When you think about electrical, often we're going to hear words like trunk lines, branch circuits. Think about electrical as a tree, right? That's why they call them a trunk and a branch circuit. So eventually you start aggregating things because you do not want to have 30 circuits or 40 circuits on a battery, right? It has to be modular. You've got a large wire leaving, going to positive distribution, negative distribution. Then those go out, fan out to sub-distribution. They go to panels, and it's like a tree. There's only ever one path back to the ground with a tree, right? So you never want to have loops. You don't want to have parallel paths ever, right? You only ever want to have one path from an end appliance. Imagine a leaf, a light, and there's only one path that will go to the ground. Only one path. There are multiple circuits but there's only ever one path back to the ground. Yes, question. Do you have to fuse uh, the battery connector from a solar panel or not? Yeah, the question was, do you have a fuse on a, from a solar panel to a controller, for example, or to a battery? Or to a battery. Yes, all, it's a black and white rule. This is truly black and white. All non-starter circuits have to be fused including solar panels. And you'll notice on the slide, there's a little wiggly line. Looks like sort of a long S. That is the fuse connected to the battery. So the solar controller has a fuse. The positive connection to the battery has to be fused. Has to be. Black and white. That's the code. Now, again, scary part. How many of us have unfused circuits in our boats? Too many. Too many of us because it works without a fuse until you need a fuse. Gentleman in the back, question. Can the uh, wind generators get in, interfere with your solar or get one of those separate wind generators? Yeah, so the question is can wind generators interfere with solar? Generally, there are controllers that exist that control both or convert solar and wind generators so they won't interfere. You can have a controller just for your wind generator, a controller just for your solar. Personally, I like division. You know, I'm an engineer. I like uh, sort of not having all my eggs in one basket. If you're putting a wind turbine on your boat, you're probably thinking that you're not going to be connecting to shore power too often. And if you have solar on top of it, you're really thinking you need to be off-grid. To put both of those devices in one device, if you lose it and you're in the middle of nowhere, you're toast. I mean, you're, you're far away, right? Most people that end up having wind turbines and solar are really offshore cruisers. They're people that are going off and beyond. If you're doing that, I personally would rather have dedicated devices per dedicated source of income rather than having one that's common and you lose that, you lose both. Question. The fuse thing. Is there any disadvantage to inline fuses as opposed to in a panel? The question, is there any disadvantages with an inline fuse versus a circuit breaker in a panel? No, there isn't. I do an inline fuses on solar panels all the time, all the time. And remember, I can't bring a solar panel. It's a good quiz question here. I can't bring a solar panel to a panel, a solar panel to a DC panel, panel to panel. Why? Because a DC panel is switched. And remember, solar panels have to be unswitched. You can never, ever, ever bring a solar panel controller connection to a DC panel, ever. Why? Because that is an unswitch connect, is a switch connection. All charging circuits, alternators, battery chargers, solar, wind turbines have to be connected to the unswitch distribution. I know your panel is closer. You're like, oh, it's so easy, it's right there. Can I take a shortcut? Think about it. Does Jeff like shortcuts? Do you want it easy or do you want it done right? Easy is not a place on a boat. You want easy, don't go boating. There is nothing easy about boating. There is nothing easy. Ne always do it right. Always do it right. So a question about sizing solar panels. If you've got solar panels on your boat and you're, or you're wondering, I, Jeff, I had that yesterday. I did a presentation on solar. Jeff, how do I figure out how many solar panels I need? Well, there's a really good simple rule here in the Pacific Northwest. If you've got a 100 watt solar panel, how much power is it going to output? And yes, there's a typo in this slide. 100 times 
is 25 amp hours, right? So if you, for example, have a 200 watt solar array, 25% of 200 watt is 50 amp hours. The other way of looking at it is saying, Jeff, I have a 100 amp hour, bat uh, 100 amp hour battery budget on my boat. I want my solar panels to offset all my loads. I'm going off. In the summer, I'm not plugging in. I have boaters that, like for example, I had a Grand Banks 36 a few years ago. They said, Jeff, we don't want to buy a generator on our boat. We're going to an outstation. It does not have power. We want to stay at the dock for a week. A week to two weeks. I don't want a generator. I don't want to run my engine to create power to recharge my batteries. I want you to create a solar array that will allow me to stay at the dock pretty much without power indefinitely. Sounds crazy, not crazy at all, no problem. We ended up putting a 450 watt array. Their daily power consumption was about 100. So we oversized it slightly. And they have a 450 watt array on a Grand Banks 36, right on the Bimini. And now when they go at that outstation without power, they're literally running the fridge, running their lights, running the water pump, all from power that was created, stored in the batteries, and even the batteries are running the boat overnight. And in the daytime, the sun starts, even if it's slightly cloudy, creates power, recharges the battery, and then the cycle repeats. I did it on my boat. In the summer, on my boat, I can be completely disconnected. I don't need an alternator. I don't need a battery charger. From May to September, I have more power than I need on my boat. It's doable. I do it all the time. I did a Lagoon 55. Do it all the time. Now, it takes a little bit of stomach to go through the purchasing of the solar panels. I mean, that's not easy. But once you're over that hump, and I did my boat about eight years ago, it's done. It's over. I'm completely neutral. I don't worry about power ever in the summer. Now, in the wintertime, that's a different story. In the wintertime, the sun here in the Pacific Northwest is not shining 16 hours a day. <laughs> yeah, solar in the wintertime is not, it's not as good. You win on some, you lose on others. So if you're going to be doing a solar, remember when you're choosing a controller, think about am I connecting to a 24 volt battery bank or 12 volt battery bank? Because controllers are actually designed specifically for what battery bank they're going to be connecting to. Not many of us have 24, but if you've got a bigger boat, you know, in the 50s or something, and you're doing solar, you're going to want to think about what size battery bank we're connecting, or voltage battery bank we're connecting to. You're also going to consider, you know, the maximum amperage of that solar panel array, voltage, all those factors. There's no such thing as a solar controller for any solar array. You size a solar array with a dedicated controller. They sort of work together. And remember, another thing I emphasized was if you're going to have shade on one or multiple of the solar panels, think about having dedicated controllers per solar panel, right? Not only for redundancy, but for efficiency. That's why I have a sailboat, lots of shading on a sailboat. There's booms, I've got a radar mast. There's shading all the time on my boat. So what I end up doing is I have six panels, six controllers. My array is awesome. It was painful to put in, time consuming. But you know what? There's no operating costs. Solar panels don't need oil changes. There's no fuel filter changes, right? It works. You put it in, all your capital and labor efforts are up front. You do it, and then it's done. But it's not easy at the beginning. It's always more effort than you thought it was going to be. The next thing I want to talk about here is uh, talk about a methanol fuel cell. Methanol fuel cells are a device that converts methanol to a DC charging voltage. So you need to be connected to a battery on switch side, right? Because it's a charging circuit. And that device basically runs in the background, doesn't output a lot of power, but it outputs a little power and it outputs it continuously, right? It's the difference between sort of the, the fable when we were kids, you know, the, the turtle versus the hare. You know, the rabbit goes quickly, but it's a sprinter. The turtle runs, doesn't run, it goes slowly, but over time gets there. A methanol fuel cell is something that's very quiet, runs at about 22 decibels, and it runs in the background. And it's a way for you to recharge your batteries and have it sort of converting methanol to a DC charging voltage. 
Now it's a DC device, it's not an AC device. You can't run a, a microwave off a of methanol fuel cell. And the other, real, I guess, reality is that methanol fuel is not readily available everywhere. So it's more of a coastal thing. You know, if you're going offshore and you're going to go in the South Pacific or in the Aleutians, or you're going way off and beyond, you're not going to be able to go to Bora Bora and go to Chandler and say, I want methanol M10 fuel cartridge. You're going to be like, hey, you know, I just sold one yesterday. No, it's more for the boaters here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I have some people that are doing races to Hawaii, sailboaters, right? They want power to be generated and they never want to run the engine. Not that they're actually obviously using propulsion, but they, want, they need power. We'll put a methanol fuel cell on board so that they've got power being generated in the background with actually having the need to run an engine and run an alternator. Or we'll have sailboaters and powerboaters that have generators, but the generators are giving them a lot of grief. They're too noisy um, and maintenance-wide, they're not always reliable. We'll rip out generators and replace them with something that is, you know, weighs only 30 pounds that takes, you know, a tenth of the space and we'll put them on board and then that way when they're going to Alaska or you know the Browns are north to the central coast they'll have DC power being generated by a methanol fuel cell. The units need ventilation obviously they are creating they do create a little bit of heat. The good news is they their output is distilled water so if you have flooded lead acid batteries on your boat you could actually use that water to top off your battery cells. Sailboaters are going to send the water to the bilge or on some boats where we can't send the water to the bilge because it's a dry bilge, we just have it go to sort of like, a, we'll use a bike bottle, you know, bike water bottle and we'll have the water go in there and we'll capture it and then we'll dump it overboard. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about, um, the two other topics are power sharing. Remember, and this is a prime example. We talked about a little earlier this concept of Jeff, I've got one alternator, two alternators, but I have multiple battery banks. Think about a sailboater or a simple power boat, single, sil single screw power boater, or obviously a sailboater, not catamaran with a single engine. Many of us, many of us as boaters are going to have a battery bank for a house and a battery bank for our engine. Single battery for engine and a battery bank made of multiple batteries for your house. But at the end of the day, there are two battery banks. You have a single alternator. How does one have a single alternator go to two places? It's like having an income stream. You get a check from work, you have one check. Can you deposit one check to two bank accounts? You can't. How would you do that? You tear the check in half, you go to one bank, give some money, you're like, hey, I, I spread it evenly. I'm going to do 80% in this bank, 20% in this other bank. It's a problem, right? So how do you share one alternator to multiple places? Same thing with solar. Maybe you have only one solar panel, one controller, but you want to recharge another battery bank. How do you have one battery bank share with another battery bank? Or do, how do we have one alternator go to multiple battery banks? So those are two different devices. The first one we're going to talk about, and you'll see on the slide, a little bit in the middle, there's a little device called a battery combiner, and just above it is a device called a battery isolator. So the next two things we're going to talk about are battery combiners and battery isolators. The battery isolator is in the middle of the slide. So what does a battery isolator do? A uh, battery combiner, sorry, misspoke. It's a device that whenever it senses a charging voltage, effectively puts your batteries in parallel. What does that mean? It's sort of a device that opens and closes a door. And it does so automatically. It's sort of like a greeter. It says, you know what, in times of plenty, I will share the voltage from one battery bank to another battery bank. Meaning, whenever I sense that one battery bank is full enough and I have more than I need in one battery bank, I will basically let that voltage be shared to another battery bank. A battery combiner is effectively, it's a digital solenoid. It's a device that automatically turns a switch on and off and says now it's time to share. And it's really essential because it allows multiple battery banks to exist on your boat and to get a charging voltage from one single source. That's how you have multiple battery banks on a boat, with a battery combiner. 
Notice that they're both connected to the unswitched distribution, meaning there are no switches in between a battery combiner and a battery, right? Now, what I decided to show here on this diagram, if you look on the left-hand side, what you'll see is that I have an engine battery, it's connected to a fuse, right, directly to the battery. And then on the right-hand side, I have it connected to the unswitched distribution, which is in turn connected via fuse to the battery. But there are no switches at all. Even if you turn the battery switches all off on your boat, if there's a charging voltage to one battery, and it senses that charging voltage, it will share it with the other battery that's connected to it, okay? So when you buy a battery combiner, you need to make sure that you think about what is the maximum amperage that is gonna be going through that battery combiner. Is it gonna be 55 amps, 120 amps, 300 amps? Those are things to consider. The other one that's often overlooked, again, fusing. 85, 90% of you, unfortunately, are gonna have battery combiners that are unfused because it works without it, right? Like a seat belt. So make sure that the fuse is rated to handle both the maximum amperage of the device and also the size of the wire connected to the device. Now, you can't measure voltage without ground. You can't just put one probe on something and say, I have 12 volts. Voltage is about a differential. It's a difference. It's like height. Right, it's like the water level. It's like, and you need a reference point. And so these devices need a ground because otherwise you can't measure voltage. You can't just measure voltage with one probe. You need to go the difference between this and that. That's what voltage is, it's differential. So you also need to fuse the negative um, and that's often overlooked too. I would say one last piece of advice on battery combiners, they're generally not meant for battery banks of different sizes. You want a world of magic or pain, putting a large battery bank connected to a small battery bank via a combiner will work perfectly fine, perfectly fine, until, until you have a battery bank that is very heavily discharged. Think about the analogy of water and when you have two pools of water that are at the same height and you have a pipe at the bottom of those two pools of water and they're both the same height, you open suddenly that pipe. If the, both pools are the same level, there's no flow, right? They're the same equal level. You suddenly bring that level more and more down, the more difference in level, the higher the flow. That's what we do with general, well, dams. When we create electricity, Hoover Dam in the United States, prime example, you've got a high water level on one side, you've got a low water level on the other side. The bigger the delta between the two levels of water, the faster the flow, right? Because the water is trying to equalize itself. So when you have a large battery bank that is maybe full and a small battery bank that is empty or vice versa, there could be a huge amount of flow beyond the size of your alternator, beside, beyond all size of all charging. So I've seen, for example, where the largest devices, the charger is only 40 amps, the alternator is only 55 amps. The battery combiner was fused with 120 amp fuse and the fuse blew. How could a fuse blow where the charging is only 55 and 40 amps? What happened is you had uneven battery banks. As soon as they sensed that it can share, it was trying to bring that other battery up and the current going through that was so high that it blew the fuse. And the problem is our, when fuses blow, you don't know that they blow unless you're sort of curious. And then what happens is that battery ends up not getting a charge forever and ever. And I see that with battery thrusters all the time, battery thruster battery banks. And four months down the road, the owner calls, my thruster battery bank is at two volts. What happened? Generally is that there's a fuse that blew. The fuse blew the, to the combiner and it never got a charge. And without a charge, a battery will sulfate and it will die. So that's why people buy battery isolators. Battery isolators are only connected to one charge device, generally an alternator. So that means that when you fuse that device, you know that there will never be, an alternator will never create more than its rated output. 
If you buy a 120 amp alternator, you're not going to have one day a 300 amp alternator. It's just not going to happen. I mean, if it fails, it's going to fail to zero. It's not going to fail to more, right? Otherwise, we'd all be hoping for you know failure for more output. It's not going to happen. So that's why we, in our toolkit, we often use battery isolators connected to an alternator as a way to say, for example, think about it. this would be a common ex experience. I want my battery thruster, battery bank, to get a charge when I'm running my engine. Because generally, you're using your thrusters when you have propulsion, right? I mean, that's when you should use a thruster. And, but you want that battery bank to get charged. Maybe it was full before you left the dock, right? I see that all too often. I'll see a battery charger connected to a battery thruster bank, but no alternator connected to that battery bank. Meaning if they leave the dock and they had a hard time leaving the dock, while they're underway to a new destination, that battery bank did not get a charge. And now that new destination is also windy. It's all a little bit sketchy. The thruster now is running, never got a charge until they'll see another battery charger being powered from shore power. That's why I'm a big fan of making sure that thruster battery banks get a charge from an alternator. If you're underway, like a windlass, you should not run a windlass without having your alternator running as well, right? You want to offset the voltage drop. You shouldn't be running, hey, let's not worry about running the engine. Let's lift the windlass or run the windlass, lift the anchor, and then we'll run the engine. It's not just because it's unsafe to drift. You want the alternator to help you lift that anchor and chain. Right? And you do that by running the alternator. So one of the big takeaways, again, fusing. Make sure that you fuse your battery isolators to not have what I consider nuisance tripping. Right? So if you have a 120 amp alternator, you're going to size the wire for 1.25 times that. So have the wire size for 150 amp for sure. Have the fuse size for 150 amp. Right? That way you'll never have nuisance tripping. Right? Because if the fuse trips or blows, you won't know. You don't know. Unless you're really, really curious. And think about how many of us have battery banks without voltmeters. It, again, this would never happen in the factory. The factory has someone like me driving everyone else crazy, including the accountant, the owner. And I'm like, no, you need a voltmeter. And eventually, because I'm nagging them so much, they give in. That's what engineers do. They're like, you need a voltmeter on every single battery. But how many thrusters are installed at the factory versus installed at the commissioning stage? Show of hands here, who has a thruster in the room? Anybody? How many of you have a voltmeter on your battery bank thruster bank? You do? What kind of boat do you have, sir? <laughs> of course. Absolutely. North Haven. Now, you look at a North Oven and you look at a price per length, you're a crazy person if you buy a North Oven and you look at just, why would I spend so much more money when I can buy something for so much less? Now, I can't afford a North Oven. I, I can't afford a North Oven, but I don't think people that buy North Oven are crazy. If you can afford one, the price is more than just length and space. Same thing with a Celine. It's fine. I can't afford one. I have a Catalina. It's a production boat. It's okay, but I'm not going to miss a North Oven owner or a Celine owner and say, well, that's just stupid. No, it's better. And the reason it's better is because they end up doing all the little things, right? Having a thruster battery bank without a voltmeter is having no sense of pain and doing an endurance marathon. Thrusters die all the time, not because the manufacturer of the thruster did a bad job, it's because they're run under low voltage. Same thing with windlasses. We blame the device, but what we should blame is the installation, the shortcuts. Remember, always do it right. So what I end up doing is I say, well, at least have a voltmeter near the thruster battery bank. If it takes too long to run the wire all the way back, put a little voltmeter. Be curious. You know, when you leave the boat, go check to see. Oh, yeah, I'm a checklist, right? As a boater, if you don't have a checklist, you have a phenomenal memory, or you're not doing it right. I have a checklist on my boat. I go in, I'm like, do I have a charging voltage? Yes, I can leave the boat. And so you want to do that if you have a battery thruster or a thruster battery bank or a windless battery bank or a generator battery bank or an engine battery or a house battery. You should always know what your voltage is so you can know that it's getting a charging voltage. 
All right, with that, uh, we've got some time for questions. Any question, anything electrical, just the only caveat is if you can't ask the question in less than a minute, I'm going to take the question in the back because I don't want everyone running for exits. Yes, sir. Would there be any advantage in running the anchor winch battery put it very near the anchor winch, or is it better to run off the house batteries 20 feet back? Great question. You know, the, the, the dilemma that we have as boaters is I have a windlass. Should I have a battery bank for the windlass up front near the windlass? Or can I run my windlass from a battery bank that's 20 feet away? Remember, the more battery banks you have in your boat, the more you have to manage those battery banks. It's like having multiple checking accounts, right? Imagine if you had four checking accounts, five checking accounts. You've got to start worrying, are all my accounts having money deposited in them? Are they being maintained? So that's one of the downsides of having multiple battery banks is you need to make sure that they're getting the right amount of energy, right? So that would be one reason why you wouldn't do it. But the flip side is certainly for a voltage drop perspective, it's pretty ideal to have a very battery bank almost at the windlass. The flip side is you need to find a way to charge that battery bank, which brings in complexity. 20 feet is not that far from a battery bank for a windlass. I would personally, in that situation, run large cabling. Like on my boat, that's what happened. I have a 35, 36 foot boat. My battery banks are midship. The run to the windlass is about 20 feet, but 20 feet return, right? So it's about a 40 foot run. I have a 1500 watt windlass, because I always go bigger. Of course, always go bigger. The engineer in me can't stop. And then I have two watt wiring from the windlass to the battery. Now, I can tell you, I spent more money on the wiring than I did the windlass. But my windlass runs amazing. It's 10 years, and I have a voltmeter on my windlass at the helm. And when I'm running my windlass, I can see the volts at the windlass, and I have very little voltage drop. But most people, when they install a windlass, they buy the least expensive wire that they can humanly buy. And unfortunately, the consequences of that is their windlass end up failing prematurely. I don't like failure, and I like predictability. So go with, in your situation, go with big wires and have it run to the house battery bank. In that situation. Yes, in the back. As a follow-up to that, if you have a bow thruster battery up front, can you put your windlass to that same battery bank? Yeah, that's another great question. So on a boat where you have a thruster battery bank, should your windlass be run off that battery or off the house battery? In most situations, I would run the windlass off a thruster battery bank. You already are going, you already have a bank there. You might as well minimize the voltage drop. You already are dealing with the fact that you've got to charge the thruster battery bank. And you're rarely, rarely running a thruster at the same time as a windlass. Could happen, but pretty rare. Could happen. It could happen. There's situations where you might have side winds and stuff like that, or you're anchoring and you're trying to be precise in your anchoring spot. But generally, you're not going to be running a windlass and a thruster at the same time. So I would say in those situations, I would run a windlass to a thruster battery bank before I would run it on a house. OK? Another question. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, magical electricity question. I have a stainless steel sink basin that somehow has 12 volts of current, and although there's no wires up interacting with it at all. OK. Wow. That is magic. Question uh, is that I have a stainless steel sink or basin in my galley. Is it a galley? In the galley. And it's actually energized with 12 volts. That's terrifying. Where the hell is it coming from? That is, that's, yeah, OK, all right. There are no wires connected. Yeah, so. Plumbing is grounded somehow. Metal plumbing is grounded. Yeah, that's, that's intense. That's, that's, that's like sort of like that I can move objects with my mind. <laughs> <laughs> like teleportation. Uh, one thing that I would worry about is if the sink is somehow connected to a stream of water, and your water is actually energized. So you're actually putting 12 volts in the water around your boat. That I would love. I don't know, never seen that. That is a world of pain. 
you can that's it just you got to be that's not something you can put on the back burner you know how, you know how we all have lists as voters and there's important things and not so important things and things you'll deal with later that one is right at the top unless you have a gasoline engine and it's leaking and you have non-ignition protected devices in the gasoline engine room that one's got to make it to the top that one has got to be yeah absolutely okay other question oh yeah in the back yeah i've got uh, six six volt um, batteries uh, deep cycle batteries uh, golf cart batteries in my uh, house bank and i'm thinking about swapping them out for agm um, does that mean I probably need a bigger alternator? I do have a, a higher speed than a 55 amp, but um, and also a bigger charger, and I have an independent 40 amp uh, charger. Okay, all right. Let me paraphrase. Tell me if I got this right for the benefit of everyone. Uh, this gentleman has six golf cart batteries, and golf carts by default can only be deep cycle, by the way, and he did mention that. So golf cart batteries are only deep cycle batteries, flooded. So they're flooded deep cycle golf carts. Can you confirm if it's a 12 volt boat? 12 volts or 24? 12? 12. So six golf cart batteries, there's gonna be, they're gonna be wired in series in parallel, right? Because you gotta get to 12. So that's about a 600 amp hour battery bank. Marketing is gonna say 700, 720, but let's not believe marketing. So let's bring it down to reality. It's about a 600 amp hour battery bank at 12 volts and the gentleman has an alternator that's bigger than 55 amps but we don't know the size and the battery charger is 40 amp so right off the bat from our presentation we talked about the minimum size of a charger has to be 10 percent of a deep cycle battery bank off the bat 40 is definitely smaller than 10 percent of a 600 amp hour battery bank because 10 percent of 600 is 60. So you're running right now two-thirds, or 6.6% of your ideal charging rate. So currently right now, for sure, your battery charger has to be increased at least 60 amps. At least. That's minimum. Remember, minimum is not ideal. It's minimum. So yes, regardless if you change AGM or not with your golf carts, you should go with a larger charger. And AGMs can take a higher rate of charge. So if you put an inverter charger, for example, a 3,000 watt inverter charger with a 150 amp charger, those batteries could take easily 150 amp charge rate. Easily. That would be about 25% of capacity and no problem. So there's a minimum of 10% and AGM is still also 10%. And your alternator also should be, but remember, this is, I'm, I could go down a rabbit hole and I have a 20 minute conversation on YouTube on this. But what you see is not what you get in life. If it was, it would be so easy, right? A 55 amp alternator will never output 55 amps. You're like, what? No, a 55 amp alternator under normal like output, so you're at cruising RPM and you're not trying to save fuel RPM. You're actually like loaded, not wide open throttle, but at 85%. So you're not like, like on a diesel, you're at 2600 RPM. On a gas boat, you're at 4,500 RPM. You're gonna get maybe about 25, 30 amps out of a 55 amp alternator. There's a lot of reasons for that. I can't spend too much time. That's why you want a bigger alternator. Like for example, think about it. I have a, one of my service vehicles in our fleet is a Sprinter, Mercedes-Benz Sprinter. I think the alternator on board is, well on board, on the vessel, vessel, I can't even say non-marine terms. On the truck, I think it's a 240 amp alternator. I never see 240 amps from that alternator. It's internal regulated, that's when it's cold, as soon as it gets odd, it's derated by 15%. Internal regulation derates it by another two thirds. I'm never running my engine at maximum RPM. All of those are derating. And that's why you generally get a little bit more than half than your rated output with an ex internally regulated alternator. So there's room for improvement if you go to AGM. That's the long version. Anybody else have questions? All good? Our, oh, yes. Uh, the charge control, solar charge controller has to be mounted close to the batteries, right? Yeah, ideally, yes, absolutely. In an ideal world, a solar controller should be mounted as close to the batteries as possible. What would be your maximum distance and guidance for that? 
The question is, is there a maximum way that you can get away as close as possible? I've seen instances where the solar controllers are 20, 30 feet. I've seen that. Um, there are reasons why you want it as close as possible. But again, this is the, the problem, and I'm going to just put a little bit of sort of a parenthesis here. There is no such thing as a boat, an ideal boat. Remember we talked about that? And a boat that conceptually follows every rule does not exist. So people that are on forums that give you black and whites all the time, people that live in a world of it has to be this way and no other way, generally what they don't realize is a boat is full of compromise. Sometimes the controllers cannot be installed in the battery bank location. It's better if they are, but it's not a showstopper. So sometimes, for some reason, the controllers are located somewhere else. And I wouldn't worry too much about it. I really wouldn't. Other questions? Yes? Uh, on your conceptual diagram for that charger, um, it looks kind of like it was possible to directly power switch DC loads from the charger. Is that, is that wrong? Yeah, good question. So here's the, the, uh, the schematic that you're talking about. The gentleman was asking, Jeff, I'm looking at your conceptual diagram and I'm wondering, can you, in this situation, the way you have it wired, is it possible to run your switch loads directly from your charger? And if you look at this diagram, first thing you'll notice is the charger DC output is connected to the unswitched distribution. So why is that important? Because when I shut off the battery switch that are running all my loads, all loads, except a bilge pump, because a bilge pump would be connected to an unswitched distribution, right? All loads, like uh, water pumps, lights, uh, anything, your chart plotters, your navigation suite, all those things. When I shut off that battery switch that you can see on sort of the top right of the diagram, my battery charger is only connected to the unswitched distribution, so the loads are not going to see any power. And the switch you'll notice is not connected between the unswitched distribution and the battery. It's, low, it's connected between the loads and the unswitched distribution. So the answer is no, not in this situation. Yeah, no. But this is, I'm going to parenthesis. Think about, this happens all the time, by the way. This is a world of magic. And it's related to your question. If you shut off your battery switch and you're, there's still power at your panel, right? You're, you shut off power from your batteries to your DC panel, you turn the switch off, and there's power at the panel, I would suggest to everyone that that should worry you. That's like having a house that's floating in air, there's no pipes connected to the house, and there's water flowing through the taps. That's a horror movie. I mean, that's what it is. It makes no sense. How can something not be connected to something else and yet still work? <laughs> right? Like the sink. There is obviously a connection, right? So if your DC panel is energized when you're not connected to the battery, that means that something is energizing that panel. What is it? Your solar panels, your battery charger, your methanol fuel cell, your wind turbine? What is energizing a panel without a battery? And the problem is all battery chargers are not power supplies. A power supply is a device that keeps the voltage steady regardless as loads come on and off, right? A battery charger needs to be connected to a battery because what happens, and this is literally what happens, as you slowly load up, for example, a battery charger, it will react and will offset the loads by the current, the charging current. <coughs> and so, pardon me, so as you're loading this uh, thing up, you're turning lights slowly and slowly, the battery charger is now outputting 40 amps to offset the loads, let's say. And then suddenly you shut them all off. What's going to happen to the voltage? Through the roof. It's not going to stay at 14 or 13. It might go to 20, 20 volts you'll have a voltage spike. What happens to a voltage spike? Things go kaput. That's where people lose stuff. A voltage spikes are serious. On the AC side or the DC side. 
That's why big boats, expensive boats, that have a lot of AC gear on board, have isolation transformers. They're preventing voltage spikes that happen on board. Boats that don't have them, when there's a voltage spike, and that happens on sort of destination marinas, where the voltage is not steady, and suddenly a big boat disconnects, the voltage rises, some people get a huge voltage spike, and then they lose $50,000 worth of gear on board because of a voltage spike. That's why you don't want to have any charging. Chargers are not power supplies. They're completely different devices. Okay? Any other questions? All good? I want to thank every one of you uh, for being here today and being curious about marine electrical systems. Uh, if you want to reach out, um, I want to say um, that you can, you'll be able to find all the slides on our website under the forward slash media tab. You can also find all these other presentations on YouTube. And the Seattle Boat Show is inviting all of you to provide uh, feedback at the link over here. So thank you everyone for being here.